Well, thank you. Adam, if you're cool with it, I'm going to bring on EU ambassador to Ukraine, who's in Ukraine now, uh, Katerina yeah. Makhanova, great friend, and love to have a conversation with her with you. Yeah. Um, and, and basically, Katerina, thank you. You've heard parts of the discussion, and I know your team has followed, followed this. But again, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get at our blind spots, weak spots, stumbling spots, as you sort of look at the common agenda out there between uh, uh, NATO nations, the EU, and you don't represent NATO, but you do represent the EU, and would be interested in your take on this moment. You have a former congressman who's a very important national voice on security. From your perspective, where does the security relationship blind spots today? Um, well, thank you very much, uh, Steve, for inviting me. Uh, great honor uh, meeting you, Congressman, uh, virtually. Um, and I, I will answer with a direct response, and then we'll have a few reflections on the previous conversations as well. And especially because of the comment right. made by our friend from Lockheed Martin, uh, I think that the biggest blind spot that we have right now is actually procuring in Ukraine. The level of innovation, the level of defense innovation, the level of ingenuity that the necessity forced Ukrainian, Ukrainians into uh, is remarkable. The level of development, for example, the naval drones that as of yesterday destroyed all missile carrying ships in the Black Sea. They have no longer any, thanks to right. their, uh, their, their made drones by themselves. And it's actually quite surprising to me how little defense actors on both in Europe and, and the US use it because how mm. better to test your new kit than in wartime. Right. So right. I think this is the biggest blind spot is this. Uh, Do you? One. Okay, go ahead. Uh, and uh, the second one, I very much uh, agree with the comments that both congressmen uh, made. You know, now is the time to make case for, for Ukraine. I mean, they are essentially defending themselves with their hands tied. So first, they attempted uh, an offensive without air cover, something no Western army even trains for. The Normandy landing had air cover right. 80 years ago. And, and now they have these restrictions put- and the Air Force pilot is agreeing with you. And, uh, and, and, and it's really, as, as uh, Congressman uh, Himes mentioned, it's not about flying F-16s on Moscow. It's about destroying the kid that's right on the other side of the border and with right. tighter hands. So I think that's the second blind spot. And the third one is the level of disinformation that right. the Russians are... You asked, you asked the previous speaker whether uh, Russians or the US have better intelligence. I have absolutely no doubt it's the US and, and, and the West has better mm. intelligence, but they are much better at disinformation, at corrupting elites and disinformation. Mm. And I think there is a lot of sort of mythology that we respond to still or disinformation right. rather, than, rather than the reality. So these are the three right. blind spots I see. Right. And my last sentence is that Guys, we have agency. It's the West that mm -hmm. has agency in this war. And, yeah. and it is a Suez well, moment because we will determine whether they win or not. Well, let me ask Adam to respond to any thoughts and bring on any other issues. We have Jake Auchincloss, uh, a member of Congress who's been very active on the Select Committee on China, intelligence, and is kind of a broad swath of concerns. Um, I'm going to get into something that that I'm going to discuss with Jake in a moment with um, uh, the ambassador. But but Adam, your thoughts? Yeah, look, it's it's really basic, and I, I like what the ambassador said at the very end, which is we get to determine our future here. We've got to get look. If you take the economy of Europe and, and the economy of the United States, generally Europe and the United States are roughly equal economies, right? Nothing against Italy. We love Italy. Russia's economy right. is the size of just one EU member, Italy. We get to determine the future of Ukraine, the future of Europe, right. and it's Russia that should fear escalation. I think that's right. the big thing. We used to, as Americans, call out Soviet nuclear bluffs and know they weren't using mm -hmm. it and go about our days and do our foreign policy, and we crushed the Soviet Union. 
I think this is where it's important. We have atrophied those muscles of strength. And this is where it's important for us to remember that we get to determine. We get to determine what the future of Ukraine is. And by the way, it is international law, which is pretty conservative, that allows Ukraine mm. to destroy Russian material in Russia. We know the Biden administration will get there eventually. Look, they've done an OK job in Ukraine, way better than the Trump administration would do. We know they're going to get there eventually. The earlier, the better. That's what I have to say. Thanks. Katharina, let me ask you a quick question before I bring on uh, Representative Auchincloss. Um, I, we have all watched um, Adam Kinzinger become a kind of conscience in the foreign policy area of views. And, and I know him, you kind of sort of see how uh, both reacting to isolationism in the GOP, but kind of looking at, you know, how do you make the proactive, positive case for American engagement in the world? I would say in Europe, you also have a kind of, um, I don't know what they called it, a deterioration, but a different focus. I, I interviewed at the conference I'm at now, the Global Security Forum, um, former Trump National Security Advisor Robert O'Brien today. And uh, Robert O'Brien is very hawkish on Russia. And I said, wow, um, that doesn't sound like the Donald Trump I've heard. It doesn't sound like the Tucker Carlson dovish wing on Russia, much more hard line on Russia. And so it just made me think that there are these divides within different camps. And there are now divides in Europe. Uh, I, I won't say the H word, but you know which country I'm talking about. Uh, there may be others that begin. How hard is it for you to play a role synthesizing a consistent message uh, on these um, European issues with Ukraine? Um. Well, I think that one one thing I want to say that the EU itself, the institutions in Brussels right. and member states have become security actors uh, as yeah. a result of uh, of the full scale invasion in quite unprecedented ways, and hmm. uh, and and even EU uh, budget instruments used for the purchase of weapons under a name of peace facility, a little bit Orwellian, right? And uh, uh, and it's true that. The U.S. the EU consensus is not as easy to come by, but right. it has been consistent. We are now preparing 14th round of sanctions, and those right. are unanimous. I mean, this is the right. trick. You need unanimity uh, for right. every step on foreign policy. So far, we've gotten it, whether we mention or not mention uh, letters yeah. of alphabet. So uh, I think that uh, there is... Right. The, the peer pressure has been uh, has been working, Great. but it's not easy. Well, look, um, I want to thank both of you. Adam Kinzinger has to run. He's got another TV hit. Um, uh, Katrina Martinova, I hope you'll stay with us.